Wow, wow, wow. This is all for me. This is not for Yolle. So uh, I'm actually having this presentation today. No, I am will definitely not because I don't know anything about computing and everything. So I'm just glad to be here and to learn new stuff. But I'm here in another uh, role. role as well. Um, I'm here from Society and I work as a recruiter and a team manager. And so I will hopefully talk to a lot of you afterwards when grabbing a pizza and a beer. Um, so that will be lovely. Uh, and just a short thing, a presentation about Society. I don't know if everybody knows what we do and who we are, but we are a consultant company and are a part of the whole Capgemini group. Uh, we have 21 offices in Sweden. So here in Skåne, we have in Malmö and in Helsingborg. And we have a lot of different roles and uh, doing really cool stuff. We have a lot of developers. Some of them are here today. <laughs> we have people working in data and AI, test, uh, project management, scrum masters, uh, and etc. And that was a bit short about us. And now we're going down memory lane together with Jolle. So round of applause, please. Thank you. Uh, no, that's the one. Nothing happens. Try this one. OK. This is me. This is what I work. I should be over here, I've been told, as close to the corner as possible. This is me. Um, I work for Society. As a senior developer, I'm allowed to do basically anything I want, including doing these presentations in the evening, which has nothing to do with my actual role, but I like it. It's fun, and I hope you will be awake after I've stopped talking and enjoyed it as well. Um, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt. I honestly love dialogue, although you should keep in mind that I have a very ambitious agenda for tonight, and I plan to talk for the entire session that I have available, so any question you ask will eat your pizza. And that's fine, because cold pizza and warm beer is okay. So shoot if you want to. Does that work? No, it doesn't work. There we go. Uh, Olivia already told you where we came from, and since we are a French company, it is pronounced Sojeti. It is not Sogeti or Sogeti or, well, any other so pick? So shit is not, no, that's, that's right. It's not so shitty either. Um, very little shit. Um, so, <clears throat> and, and speaking about pronunciation, I really hope that there are at least one that doesn't speak Swedish here tonight. Could you please raise your hand if you don't speak Swedish? Great, because all my jokes are in English and I wouldn't be able to do this presentation in, 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 uh, in Swedish. Where are you from? Canada. Canada. So you speak English or are you French or natural language? No, and you? From Ukraine. Cool. Oh, I have a joke. <laughs> uh, um, an Englishman, a Russian and a Ukrainian walks into a bar and the Ukrainian looks at the Englishman, looks at the Russian, and then goes over to the bartender. What does she say? You don't know? Yeah. I have no clue. I don't speak Ukrainian. I was thinking that you, if anyone, would be able to tell me. But uh, no, OK, yeah. Um, Ukraine. <clears throat> we are starting with a quiz. And that's why you have pen and papers. You're going to answer three questions, one on each paper. I'm going to ask for years. And you can ask a range. You can say that it was in the mm-thies, or, or uh, if, if you're not really sure what century you think it was. But the more precise, the, the better, of course. So here's the first question. <laughs> When did we start using computers? And I would like if you not only wrote down the year, you think, or the time period, but also what question it is you're actually answering, so we can 
we can sort them out um, afterwards. So, first use of computers. Okay. The one you are thinking of. Hmm? First written program. Something that is supposed to be executed by a computational machine. When did we do that? And the first concept of AI. And if you've forgotten the questions, I've put them here so you can uh, see them. And we actually have prepared a place for you to put them on. So once you have answered, I hope that I will get help from Olivia collecting your answers, and we will put them on these posters here. <clears throat> So, everyone answered? No? Wow. Well, that, no, that's, that's okay. It's, 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 uh, you, you don't win anything. I, I, want, I wanted sort of to see statistically where we end up in, in um, relation to how it actually is. So you don't need to write your name. That's fine. Anonymous contributions. I'm the only one not anonymous here tonight. Who are done? You done? You done? Thank you. Oh, and that is question three. So that would be AI. Oh, good guess. Two would be first written program. That's over here. And one would be first use of computers. So, okay. you done over here? Thank you. Are they supposed to come in order? No, if you, have, if you have given me means to identify them, then that's fine. I haven't. Okay. Place them <laughs> where they are most correct. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so, that would probably be this, my guess. And. Uh, well, I don't know, this. <clears throat> first use of computers, first concept of AI, first written program. Yes, oh, thank you. First use of computers, uh, answer one. No, that's, that's AI, of course. There you go. Thank you. Takya. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, one is computers. <coughs> Two and three. For some reason, there are very many answers to the first use of computers, and so not that many for the first program. That's odd. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Tick. Du har även någon här också. First binary code. Here's someone who's been very innovative and written on the, the sticky side. So, and, and the answer is first use. That must be this one, okay. Computer. 
Let's move ahead and see if we can answer this one then. So first use of computers. We have 40s, 40s, 1820s, I think that's right, 1860, excellent replies, 1970, 71. Uh, a spread, easy to say. Sorry? 2,000 years ago. Well, that's not my answer. And I'm going for the documentation. So I can say that the first occurrence of someone mentioning in writing that they were using computers is from 1613. And you could argue that that's not impossible because they didn't have electricity, they didn't have mechanics to construct machines good enough for that. But that's because you're thinking about the wrong kind of computers. Because the right kind of computers were humans. And that's what we started to use in 1613. And what they did was that they took input data they applied rules or instructions, and they gave back an output, a result, which is exactly what computers are doing today as well. They computed the data, and they did that by hand. And they started to do that in 1613. That's where the word computers come from. We were describing human, a human occupation. but they didn't call it computers. <laughs> so, uh, I couldn't find photographs from the 17th century for some reason. Uh, so this is the oldest <laughs> photograph that I found. Um, and this, this is, they are, they are computing here. They are doing calculations and they are called, it's, it's their profession to be computers. And if you notice something on this image, you can take a look at this image as well. This is the computing division, so I'm not making it up. But do you see something specific with this? N n almost. There's a guy there. And of course there's a supervisor to make sure that they, they're doing what they're supposed to do. Could be, could be. You're not, you're not completely wrong, which I will show you later. This, in, in the 19th century, from original being something that only men did, turned to be an occupation mostly done by women. And the obvious reason for that is, of course, because they were better at it, uh, to do the math, which is kind of sad when, when we today think about the fact that girls tend to shy away from math in school and think it's too hard for them. So mostly guys go to the technical educations. When historically we have seen that it was a woman's work because they did it better. Of course they were also cheaper and, um, and it was possible for them to do at home. So uh, that was another reason. But uh, here, <coughs> this is this is the computer division of NASA in the 60s, or rather it's one of them, 100% women doing the work. These are the women that took men to the moon by providing the calculations needed to go there safely. And just how many here uh, works with development, you write code? Raise your hand. Quite a lot. Okay. So you work with computers, you do computing. What's 104 divided by 8? Not too slow. What's the square root of 361? The first one is 13, the second one is 19. Oh, okay, this one. What's the correct entry speed and angle if you want to safely bring home a capsule that's been to the moon and back with three men on board so that they can land on Earth? And you have to be specific here, because if you get it wrong, if the angle is too steep or the speed is too high, the men will burn up in the atmosphere. If it's too shallow, 
they will bounce off the atmosphere and go to a place where no man has been before. <laughs> they did it. They made those calculations and they got the guys back several times. So computers were humans. That's where we got the word from. Eventually, we had innovation so that we started to come up with machines that could do this task for us. And to differentiate them from the humans, we call them machine computers. So we had computers and we had machine computers originally. But the question is, when did we start to see those? And the answer here can be debated because there are many candidates for this particular place in history. Here's one very early candidate. This is a navigational computer. Uh, unfortunately, it is very old. It is from a, a long, long time ago. But it's also from a galaxy far, far away. So we didn't know about it until 1977 when they showed a documentary about a war that they've had among the stars uh, a long time ago in that galaxy and then we got to know about these computers but at that time at 1977 we already had computers of our own and this didn't really have any effect on 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 the computing development in on earth but it was uh, definitely the first candidate here's another one <coughs> This machine was constructed to help with census work in the States. Um, you know, ask every citizen, how old are you? Who are you married to? Where do you live? How big is your kitchen? How many kids do you have? All of that. States want that kind of data because that helps them to plan their society. But it is in a very elaborate task to to, to uh, make any analysis, analysis of the data, to, to, to sort of put it together. You can collect it, but then you need to handle all this information. So what the Hollerith machine does is that it uses punch cards to put down the data, and then this machine takes the punch card and can read the holes and make assumptions based on that. If there's a hole there, then this is a married guy. If there's a hole there, then they have three kids, and so on. This became a huge success because it, it uh, reduced the time from 12 years of ana analysis. Uh, I can't even say it. You know, go through the data that you had and make some, some uh, sense of it. It took them 12 years each time they did a count. And they reduced it to down to like six months or something like that. Um, <clears throat> This was uh, the origin of a company that was called Computing Tabulating Recording Company. I'm sure you've heard of it. No? Okay, in 1924, it changed name to International Business Machine, or more commonly referred to as IBM. Have you heard of that? Okay, this is the start. And this is also where we got punch cards from. And as a curiosity, when I had my first computer job in 1977, we actually had a punch card division in the company. We were still working with punch cards in 1977. It's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit too much to say a division. It was, it's, well, it was a room with a couple of old ladies. But we still sold that service to handle companies' punch cards and do work with them, put that information into the computers that we had at hand for the time. Could this be a candidate? This is Zeta 3. It was a German machine, very advanced, used to calculate um, the V2 rockets so that they would land in the correct place, have enough fuel and the, the right angle. Uh, unfortunately, this did not make a mark in history because it was bombed to oblivion in 1943. And the people that designed it, that worked with it, they were scattered into every direction because they were, at that time, more interested in surviving than advancing computing. So it became a parenthesis in, in history. This is another example. I'm not sure how to, sp to uh, pronounce that, but Atanasov, Atanasov 
BlackBerry computer made in the US uh, did not make a mark in history because it was abandoned. Uh, Atanasov was called off from uh, the work with this machine to, uh, by the um, Department of Defense to do other more important stuff that they needed him for. So it never made a mark either. Here's a good candidate, the Colossus. British was used at Bletchley Park, if you heard of that, helping them decipher German secret radio messages, the Enigma machine. They used this computer to do that. And had history turned out differently, this could have been the first computer that we heard of, and that put a mark on the rest of the computing industry. But unfortunately, the Brits, the Englishmen, um, they were so paranoid that they didn't tell anyone about it. It was a secret until 19, again, 1977. That's when they released some of the classifications that they had around Bletchley Park project. So we didn't know about it until way too late for it to have any significance in the computing industry. So instead, we got the ENIAC. American Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. This is how it looked. Um, this was the first programmable electronic general purpose digital computer. And with digital, I don't mean binary, I actually mean decimal. Uh, it had 18,000 vacuum tubes, 17,200 crystal diodes, I have to read here because I don't remember this, 1,500 relays, 70,000 resistors, 10,000 capacitors, and approximately 5 million hand-soldered joints to keep it together. Um, <clears throat> it was 30 meters long, so this is only part of it. Uh, the vacuum tubes that they used, I think you can see some of them on top here, uh, they were so bad, so they continuously busted. So the downtime of this computer was generally around 50%. They could only use it half of the time. The rest of the time they repaired it. And the longest period they had of operation without failure was in 1954. That's almost 10 years after they, they initially built it. Uh, 116 hours, about five days, that it worked without crashing for them. So uh, the, the woman here, she is not um, a model to make it pretty. She's one of the six programmers that they hired. They were all women. Uh, they hired them because they were good. They were uh, mathematicians. They were computers. Uh, and they were available, and men wasn't because they were out fighting. So they had to use women instead. Uh, and after the war was over, Second World War, they couldn't replace them with men because they were too good. No one else could pick up their competence because it was so complicated to, to make this beast work that they were uh, impossible to replace. Unfortunately, oops. Uh, no, one, no one cared about that, that they were pivotal to this project. Uh, when they presented it for the public, they had a press conference, and they had a dinner, and they had a party after the dinner with all the important people. None of those six women were invited. They weren't mentioned until uh, 1997. That's when they got public recognition. At that time, several of them were dead. Uh, programming was done by writing on paper. You see, she has a sheet of paper or a number of papers in her hand. She wrote instructions on those papers. Then she handed them over to this guy. He's not a programmer. He's a technician. His role is to move these wires around in, in accordance to the uh, programming instructions. So it would say, take wire, I don't know, 16P-12-XXY and put it in position A, B, 
214. And he would go, A, B, 214, poof. So, and then they would run the program after he had shifted all the wires around. It wouldn't work. And they would go, oh, what the wires? That was the debugging part, trying to find out what cable was in the wrong position, or if it was possibly one of the tubes that were broken. So uh, figured to have that as a backend uh, server. Uh, not entirely possible. But thanks to ENIAC and its success, the US took the lead here. They leaps into forefront of computer development and commercialization. And UK might have been there had they not been so bloody secretive with their work. Uh, the US used universities to help them develop their war effort computers. They, they assigned it to MIT and, and Berkeley and the li likes, and they did the work there, which meant that it was civilians that did the work. Whereas the UK, they recruited them as soldiers they enlisted them, and they gave them heavy restrictions on what they were allowed to say even after the war. So they couldn't commercialize that competence. Instead, the uh, U.S. takes the lead. <coughs> and um, we get to know names that we recognize even today. Here are examples of the involvement that we had with the computers during the late 40s and, and 50s. Um, Unimac, DEC, IBM became a big player within the computing world. HP, new player, that took a significant role as well. They all popped up here, well, except the IBM. They, they popped up 1924. Um, LOC stands for Library of Congress, and um, the, these machines were huge, very expensive. You have to have great funding in order to afford them. The Library of Congress was one of those that could start using them. And I have a very funny story about that, but I also realized that our time is short, so I might not have time to tell it, but please remind me afterwards, if there is time and you are still awake, we, we can go into why they had some severe crashes of their entire computer park at Library of Congress. We'll do, and I also have a history about hamburgers. You can remind me of that too. So let's let's move on to something else. <coughs> Who's this noble woman here? She's up there as well. Look, uh, further over, over there, over there. <laughs> Ada Lovelace, exactly. <laughs> Didn't live for long, but made a mark in history. Uh, the portrait is painted 1836. This is the AL in the headline for this talk, from AL to AI. This is AL. And she was a brilliant mathematician and explorer of mathematical mysteries. She would have had a chance to get a Nobel Prize had it existed, and this time didn't. Uh, and the reason she deserves a place here is because she wrote the first computer program. Who answered 1840 on that question over here? Did we have anyone? Staffan, because he's a friend of mine, so he knew it. <laughs> you had 19th century, that's good. Yeah, 19th century, there we go, that's cool. Yeah, there's one, 1800 tall. Yeah, so some, some are quite, quite close. That's cool. 1979, some are not as close. Um, it is kind of strange that she could write this, given that it would take another 100 years before we actually had computers. But what she did was that, thanks to her brilliance, she became friend with another genius within the area of mathematical explorations, Charles Babbage. And he designed what he called an analytical engine that would have, had it been built, been the first computer. It had all the traits that we see in a modern computer today. 
but he never built it. Uh, instead, he held a seminar or a presentation about the project for a society in London. And on that society, in the audience, was an Italian young engineer who got very fascinated by the concept. So he wrote about it in French and published it in a French newspaper, an article about the stuff that he'd heard in London. And Babbage, he, he um, I don't think I have more to, to show here. He, he asked Ada to translate that article to English for him. And she did. She spent nine months doing that because she was very ambitious. And not only did she translate the articles, the article, she also included footnotes. And in fact, the footnotes that she included are three times longer than the article. One of the footnotes, footnote G, is an example of how a program would look run by the Bab Babbage analytical engine. This is not a writing. This is, uh, um, I don't know what to call it. This is, this is published later. But this is her code uh, behind it. And she is recognized for this. I, uh, you've heard of the programming language ADA. You might think that that was an acronym, but it's not. It's actually from her name that it's got that name. There are. In the university in the U.S., they have departments that are called Ada Lovelace or Lovelace Room and stuff like that. They, 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 um, she is recognized for her role here. So next area. I didn't ask you about this when we had the first bug or, uh, or so, but uh, uh, you who write code here, have you ever written code and not have a bug? I, I would not think so. I, I, it's nigh impossible. So uh, it goes without saying that the history of bugs is as old as the history of computers uh, and computing. And, and uh, the, indeed, there are people that say that Ada Lovelace's program example contained bugs. So even the first program was buggy. But why do we call them bugs? Why do we not call them yikes or buggers or ducks or errors. I have an error in my code would be sort of more relevant to say than say, I have a bug in my code. Uh, so where does it come from? Well, in order to talk about that, I need to introduce you to this lovely lady. And with her, tell you the myth about the origin of bug reports. This is Grace Hopper. I love the name, Grace Hopper. She's a computer scientist, a mathematician. She's also a US State Navy Rear Admiral, or she was. Uh, this is her two years before her retirement. Uh, well, actually, two years before her third retirement, because she retired in 1966. The Navy got uh, panicked. And say no, you have to come back. We don't do, we can't do this without you. So she went back, worked for another couple of years, retired again, second time. The Navy said no, we can't do this. You have to come back. We can't w function without you. So she got back again and worked for another couple of years. And she didn't retire until she was 80 years old in 1986. Six, 80, so, sorry, 20 years after she she tried to retire the first time. And but that time she was a uh, rear admiral. Um, before she went to the, the, the Navy, which she started in 1943 as a computer specialist, she had a PhD at Yale and was a mathematics professor at Vassar College. Uh, and after the work, war, she worked in a team that developed UNIVAC, which you could say was basically the first supercomputer, or, or what we then started to call supercomputers. The best of the best computers were called supercomputers. Um, She's also the inventor of programming languages as we know it. Back in those days, programming was, well, first to move wires, but then they wrote machine code. And she insisted on saying that now it would be better if we wrote in English. And her superior said that ah, that's a waste of time. Don't do it. And she insisted. So 
in that process, what, what she wanted was that you write in English and then you have the computer compile it into machine code. So she not only uh, come up with that concept, she actually wrote the first compiler. And she wrote a couple of programming languages as well. Have you heard of COBOL, anyone? She wrote it. Fortran, same. She wasn't alone in that process, uh, but she had a crucial role. She was the leader of the gang and the visionary that pointed the direction of how she wanted this to, to be. And here's the myth. In 1947, she and her team was working on, on the Navy uh, Mark II computer, uh, which looked like this. Impressive. Um, and they found a moth, an insect, stuck in one of the relays of the machine, and it stopped operations. So they made a log report with a bug taped to the paper. And the text, first actual case of bug being found. And this is claimed to be the first bug report, and the first, or not the first, but written by Grace Hopper. None of that is true, actually. I'm sorry. It's a good story, but it's not true. Uh, she didn't write it. This is not her handwriting. And the word bug had been used by engineers in the States for at least 100 years before that. You could have a bug in a, in a drawing. You could have a bug in a specification of components. You could have a bug in a construction. They used the word bug a lot. So it is more likely that the team around the Mark II knew about this. They called their reports bugs and were happy to actually have a bug to attach to it this specific time. Uh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> this is not the first portable computer. This is a computer that is being moved in a car, but this is actually a mini computer. And I'm not going to talk a lot about mini computers, but they became very popular late 50s into the 60s because they were smaller than mainframes and they were definitely way more cheaper. This machine, this particular machine, when it was launched, cost $18,000. That was at least 10 times cheaper than a mainframe, the starting cost of a mainframe. So they became popular in medium-sized organizations because they could afford them, and it had the computing power to do the tasks that they uh, needed to be done. So the, the year, I think this is 1956. I can look it up for you if you want to. I have, yes? Th they were useful for doing bookkeeping, calculations, uh, 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 st stock holding, I mean, you used them for what you used computers for, which was uh, administrative tasks. Uh, the private yes, yes, in the private sector. You would buy them to, to run your grocery store or a or, or series of grocery stores, rather. Uh, and, and, uh, or um, I, I know Lund University had them out on their different departments, so, so that they didn't need to bother the mainframe computer with uh, compu computational tasks. Instead, they were used directly on the institution. As late as uh, 1986, they had mini computers on some of the departments in the Lund University. I know, I worked with them. So, popular and cheap. But this is not portable directly, right? So, when we're thinking about uh, a portable computer. We want something that you don't need a house to fit it in or a nearby power plant to drive it. Uh, it has to run on battery um, and it has to be able to be used while moving. That's portable. So we go for this instead. This is my candidate to the first portable computer. Impressive? No? OK. Um, Introduced 1966, uh, it weighed 32 kilos. It had a power consumption of mere 55 watts, which is really good for something this heavy. Um, 
It is based on silicon integrated circuits, which was the first in ever to be built using that, which enabled it to be so small. And I remember in the 70s, you probably also, you went to the electronics store and bought transistors and condensers and ICs. And with that, you could build cool stuff because you have a paper with, with instructions on how you put it together and what you've soldered to what part of the uh, circuit board. And, and, and with that, you could turn on light bulbs and stuff like that. Amazing. Well, I tried, but I failed. <laughs> But yes, you could build calculators as well using them. So um, <clears throat> I wasn't very good at that because I was so sloppy when I did the soldering. So. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to explain what this is. Uh, I'm, I just have to read up. So sorry. Uh, 32 kilos is still rather hefty, and it, it's actually excluding batteries. So you couldn't just tuck it under your arm and and move about with it. I mean, I move this around. This is nine kilos. So um, you had to put it, uh, oh yeah, there's the ICs here. You had to put it inside here. Or rather, and also inside here. That's how you moved it around. This is the Apollo program's navigational computer used to put men on the moon. And notice that I say men, not man. So, because there weren't any women in that crowd. As a computer viewed with our eyes, it's not very impressive. I can say that I have way more computer power in my refrigerator, um, with the difference that my refrigerator will never ever be able to go to the moon. So, that's a shame. Or, uh, Don't say that. <laughs> no. We'll, we'll, we'll see, yeah, attach it to some rockets. Uh, so, but this one enabled Armstrong okay, to say his famous word. Houston, uh, and quality base here. The Eagle has landed. Did you think I was going to play the quote where he says something about steps and men? And <laughs> no, 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 too easy. The, this, this is when he was actually using the computer. When he walked around on the moon, he didn't have a computer with him. So this is way more relevant. And this would be the first uh, portable computer. Kudos! This is uh, an interesting part in the history of personal computing. And that's basically where we are right now. The birth of computers that you could put on your desk. They were not called PCs to start with. They were called microcomputers. And what enabled them was the introduction of microprocessors that made um, this possible. Yeah. Uh, they were initially hobby projects. You built them yourself because it was fun. They weren't very useful until yeah, we should take a peek into this house here. The house is completely uninteresting. What's interesting here is actually the garage. This house belongs to a guy named Paul Reynold, Reynold Jobs. And the garage was eventually taken over by his son and some friends of his son. His son's name was Steve Jobs. And this is Steve Wozniak. They are the founders of Apple. I'm sure you've heard of them. This guy here is Ronald Wayne. Have you heard of him? No one? It was the guy who sold his stock. Yes. He owned 10% of Apple and sold it to Steve and Steve for $2,300 because he got cold feet shortly after they have started the company. If you buy Apple stocks today, you get about 12 shares for $2,300. And he had 10%. He would have been a very rich man if he had kept them, but he didn't. And that's not the point. The point is that this is where the interesting part of personal computers development start. Wozniak built a device they called the Apple II, and it became a huge success in 1977. Interesting year, 1977. 
it wasn't the first one. It wasn't the only one. We had others. Uh, someone who's probably listening on YouTube right now uh, wanted me to talk about the Commodore 64, which was launched about the same time and was also very popular. But they were hobby projects, all of them. The Apple II was something that companies bought and saw use for. In, in their companies. So this made IBM very interested in this market because they realized that they were about to be outcompeted with their mainframe solutions from this. So they decided that they had to take a look at this market. So 1981, they launched the IBM PC. That's where we have the word PC from. IBM made that popular. The problem being that they had no internal competence to build on. They didn't know how to do an operative system. They didn't know how to construct a machine this small. So they went out on the market and bought everything they needed. They bought processors from one company. I think you know the name of that one. If not, Intel. They bought graphic cards. They bought drives, everything on the open market, including that they didn't have an operative system. So they needed to buy an OS from someone, anyone. And here's the kudos story. The most popular operative system at the time was called CPM80. A lot of computers ran that. It was developed by a company in Texas that was owned by a married couple. IBM wanted to use this and sent two of their heavies to Texas to negotiate a deal with this company. They had arranged a meeting, but at the time of the meeting, the, the, the company was owned by a married couple, and the husband, he decided that it was more fun to fly helicopters than to meet the IBM dudes. So he wasn't at home. He was out flying helicopter. He left his wife to meet the IBM heavies, and the first thing they did was that they took an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, and stuck it under her nose and said, you have to sign this before we say anything on why we are here. And she refused. I'm not signing anything. Nope. nope. I'm going to talk with my husband first. So the heavies left. They never told her why they were there. And instead, they have heard of another small company in Seattle with a very young CEO who was called whose name was, it wasn't called, his name was Bill Gates. And the company was Microsoft. So they went to his company instead, had a meeting with him. He swallowed hard, but signed the NDA. And they then told him why they were there. They needed two things. They needed Microsoft Basics Interpreter, because at that time, every computer, every microcomputer needed a Basics Interpreter, so you could do anything. And they needed an operative system. Microsoft didn't have that. They had the basics interpreter, but IBM mistakenly thought that they had an operative system as well, and they didn't. They didn't own one. They haven't never developed one. So they left. And once they've gone, Bill Gates realized that across the town in another part of Seattle was another company that had an operative system that maybe they could buy. So he went there, and he got the chance of buying it. He bought the entire intellectual property for $50,000, including the guy who'd written the operative system, and brought that home to, to, um, to Microsoft. So he, he didn't buy the rights to it. He bought the actual code and the actual intellectual properties, got sole control over this. But when he sold it to IBM for $80,000, he sold it as a non-exclusive license meaning that he had contained the right to sell it to someone else, anyone, that wanted to use the same operative system. And IBM figured that, ah, doesn't matter. No one can make a compatible computer anyway. Well, they were on. Uh, the operative system, by the way, and that's the point of this story, was called kudos because the creator of it considered it to be a hack. Uh, and Gary Kittle, the one guy in Texas who likes to fly helicopters, he later claimed that it was actually stolen, that it was his code that was used 
in the operative system. So it wasn't just a clone, it was an actual copy. Couldn't prove it, but he, he uh, claimed it to uh, his dying days. Um, Microsoft or, or Bill Gates didn't like this name, Quick and Dirty Operative System, so they renamed it to MS-DOS instead. And the, the, the fact that IBM had been in such a rush that they didn't do any of the actual work here themselves, they bought prod products on the market, meant that anyone else could buy the same products. They could buy the same processors, the same graphic cards, the same drives, everything. The one thing, and they could even buy the operative system, the one thing they couldn't buy was the IBM BIOS, the basic operative system that goes be first and takes care of the calls from the operative system. MS-DOS calls BIOS that executes the machine instructions. So what happened was that a company called Compaq had their staff re-engineer the BIOS. They analyzed every single call that the BIOS made and wrote down the specification for that. And then they had some other guys that took those specifications and said, okay, we're going to implement our own BIOS. And suddenly they had a computer that could do anything that the IBM computer could do. But that wasn't from IBM. And we had the IBM compatibles, which was a big thing. You remember that too. Oh, this is an IBM compatible computer, but it's half the price of IBM's. <laughs> Does the same thing. So the history then makes Microsoft the major player on the PC market, not IBM. MS-DOS turns into Windows. Windows turns into operative system that every computer needs in order to run to this day. And there were a time when Microsoft was the highest valued company on earth. IBM got competed out. They don't even sell PCs anymore. They'd sold that entire division to a Chinese company because they couldn't make any money on it. So IBM won. And that leaves us actually to basically the end of the story because in 1984, Well, we got this, this baby here. And we're on a, at a time where we have all the treats of a modern computer. We have the menu system, we have a graphical interface to start with, we have a mouse that you move around and point and click. Basically how we work with, with the stuff to this day. So this is not history anymore. Now we are sort of at present time. So. Instead, it's time to, to take a look at that, the first concept of AI. And in order to, to, uh, to get a grip of that, we, maybe we need to figure out what AI is. Is this AI? This is chat GPT. The question is here if this dude is alive. And the answer is, uh, I don't have information of his current status, but he lived between 1874 to 1956. A very intelligent answer. So, is this AI? This is machine translated. It is supposed to say meatballs. But the machine thought that this was more relevant. So I can't call this AI. This is AI. This dude here. This is from The Wizard of Oz, and the movie was made in 1936, but the book was written in 1900, so this is a very early example of an AI. And in the book, I mean, this, in the movie, this is an actor playing the robot, or the AI, whatever you want to call it, and, and that means that he has a face. They didn't have technology to make him 3D rendered and stuff at that time. They had to put a costume on, a, on an actor and makeup. But in the book, he's actually completely metal. There's nothing organic with him at all. He has a metal jaw, a metal, everything is metal. So that's a good AI. Here's another one. This is an evil AI. This is from 1927. Uh, 
it's from the movie Metropolis. She's she's uh, trying to uh, take over the world and kill all the workers because they're not needed. Here's another one, also evil. This is HAL 9000 from uh, 1968. The movie was um, uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. AI, uh, one of the good AIs, one of the nice, friendly AIs. And why do I call them AI? Well, let, let's, let's take a look at the origins. This is Alan Turing. He had a pivotal role in, in the development of uh, the Bletchley Park decrypting uh, scheme so that they could win the war. Uh, he was very early on looking at computing, AI. He constructed, uh, or not constructed, he thought up something that he called the Turing machine. And this is a short description of that, an abstract computing machine with limited memory, uh, reading memory symbol by symbol, writing symbols, and yeah, it's a sort of description of a very modern computer. But he also talked about AI. 1947, he said this, what we want is a machine that can learn from experience. The possibility of letting the machine alter its own instructions provide the mechanism for this. He even came up with a test, the Turing test. Um, yeah, are you a computer? That's not the relevant part. What, what the test does is that you have an interrogator who asks the AI questions, any question. And he also asks the same questions to a human, but he doesn't know who is giving the answer, the human or the machine, because you don't see them. They communicate through keyboard and screen. So he can ask any question, and both of them can answer however they like. The, the machine is allowed to lie. If he asks them, are you a computer, they can both say yes or they can both say no. So you can't go on that. But if he can figure out, if the interrogator can figure out who's the computer and who's the human, then the AI has failed the test and it's not an AI. They have tried the Turing test since 1950 on variations of uh, solutions to this problem. And to this day, they have not found a machine that handles it. Not, not the chat GPTs or the competi com competitors in that market. They all fail this test. So in my point of view, I would say that, no, we don't have an AI out there. There is no AIs. We have machine learnings. We have large language models. But we don't have AIs yet. And here's the final talking point that I had. When did computers take over our world? We went from this to this, mainframes, personal computers, mobile phones, and at the moment we are here. At what point did we lose control? Uh, we, we can't have a world without computers today. I don't, I don't think that's possible. It's very hard to imagine, at least, uh, that we, 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 we would be able to handle that. And, and I, I don't know when that transition happened. I remember when I went to school, the concept of person number, personal ID numbers, was introduced in Sweden. This would not have been possible had the tax agency not have had access to mainframe computers. So at least in 1968, computers had an effect in my life because that's when I started to have to deal with Pasunum. Uh, and another milestone for me, and I would say everyone else here, was the rise of internet. I haven't talked about that at all. It is actually a talking point for a future seminar that I hope Michael will pick up. Um, I even had the headline for it from Russia with love. But um, um, I was early on internet. Uh, and j j just let me check. Who here has not checked their email today or another text-based message service. Is there anyone here who hasn't done that today? No, I thought so. I jumped on that train early. I had my first email address in 1988. And there are a lot of fictional stories that computers will take over and destroy our civilization. We have Metropolis, 
This Perfect Day is a wonderful novel that you should read. Terminator, there, there are so many of examples of that. Uh, all of these stories are usually said in the future, sometimes near future. But if you ask me, computers have already taken over. We can't live without them. And if that means that they have destroyed civilization or not, I guess depends on your vantage point. Uh, this could be a good discussion point while we're eating pizza and drinking beer. I'm just going to say one thing here. This is not her eyes. This is not a glass showing her face behind the mask. This is a screen. And it is not showing a camera image of her eyes. It is showing a machine learned calculation on how her eyes probably look and behave. But it's still a rendering. It is not the actual thing. It is an interpretation of her looks that we interact with when we see this. This is a product that has been launched and will be on the market sometime next year. We don't really know when, but they have promised under 2024. So people will start walking around with these, and we will think that we are interacting with them because we can see their eyes, when in fact we are looking at a machine learning rendition. So when did they take over? Shall we have some pizza? What do you say? Thank you.